This is the second Chukwe Mekao Dumegu Juku Anu Lecture. Chukwe Mekao Dumegu Juku University, Anambra State, Iwariam Campus, November 4th, 2019, by Professor Kingsley Chini Dumogalo, PhD OON, former Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Nigeria, and the convener to build a nation, Taban. You're welcome to Njenji Media TV. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Subscribe to the channel by clicking on the bell icon for notification. I am John Paul Annie, and I read. Protocols. I thank the Vice Chancellor, Senate, and Council of the Chukwemeko Dumegu Juku University for the honor of inviting me to deliver the second Chukwemeko Dumegu Juku Memorial Lecture. A lecture series established in a fitting tribute to the legend after whom this great university is named. This is the second honor that this university is giving me. I recall that in April 2017, at your eighth convocation ceremony, Chukwemeko Dumegu Juku University conferred on me the degree of Doctor of Laws, LLD. Honoris Kosa, thank you. Ojuku University. Introduction. Ojuku in Nigerian history. Today is the posthumous birthday of the late General Dim Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku Ikembanewi Eziboburuburu, who passed on in 2011 at the age of 78. We celebrate a great man. Emeka was a great son of a great father, Sir Louis Philip Odumegu Ojuku who was the wealthiest Nigerian of his era in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. We celebrate a man who, though born into wealthy and privileged family, educated at King's College, Lagos, Epsom College in Surrey, UK, and the University of Oxford, where he obtained a master's in history, went on to chart his own independent path in life, and and the process attained greatness in his own right. We celebrate a legend, a visionary African of courage who took an indelible place in history with his leadership of, Niger of Eastern Nigeria as a military governor at a time of grave national crisis and in the short-lived Republic of Biafra. Ojuku, the legend, was the product of an historical accident that met a man of courage. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. He was thus a product of his times, just like all the major actors in the Nigerian Civil War. We must therefore judge him in history strictly in that, in that context. For without the large-scale massacre, her programs of Ibus in the northern region of Nigeria after the July 1966 counter coup crimes against humanity under hu international humanitarian law. There would have been no Biafra without the controversial failure of the Aburi Accord in early 1967. There also likely be no Biafra. These two factual points are important because Nigeria continues to wrongly hold Ndibu as a people collectively guilty of the secession attempt. As if Ibus woke up one day, woke up one bright new morning and decided to leave Nigeria. As the Ibu proverb says, a child does not cry without a reason. Clearly, then, those who blame Ujuku for the efforts by Ibus under his leadership to break away from Nigeria at that particular time and in the prevailing circumstances are those who thrive in self-serving historical narratives. The reality of the time was that, owing to an unfortunate set of circumstances, the security of the lives and property of Ibus in Nigeria could no longer be guaranteed. Ujuku simply answered the call of duty. He rose to the occasion as a result of the weight and burden of historical responsibility upon his shoulders. The real and relevant question looking back now is, 
Could the war have ended earlier in a negotiated settlement rather than the military collapse of Biafra and the short-lived republic's ultimate surrender? At any event, we must recognize that President Shehu Shagari's noble decision to officially pardon Ujuku even if there were clear domestic political calculations embedded in it and the former Biafran leader's return to Nigeria in 1982, 12 years after the civil war ended, was one of the most remarkable attempts at nation building in Nigeria. While this lecture is in honor of Dim Chukwemeko Dumi Gujuku. He is not the topic, however, but only a part of it. I have begun with this brief discourse on him because it is a lecture in his memory. And because his decisions and actions have had a strong impact on the place of Ndibu in contemporary Nigeria politics. It is to that larger subject, therefore, that we must noun 10. Ndibu in contemporary Nigerian politics. Who are the Ibu? History traces settlement in Ibu land back to 4500 BC. But more recent history goes back to the founding of the Kingdom of Onre in the 10th century. The Onre Kingdom is credited with the foundation of the culture, customs, and traditional religious practices of the Ibu, and is the oldest existing monarchy in Nigeria today. Ibu land officially became a British colony in 1902 and part of the amalgamation of Nigeria in the year 1914, occupying an area of 40,000 square kilometers. Ibu land has an estimated population of 40 million people, excluding its diaspora, making the Ibu one of the largest single ethnic groups in Africa. The contemporary political history of the Ibu in Nigeria is marked by certain milestones and is also defined by certain characteristics of both the Ibu and other ethnic nationalities in Nigeria. These events include the massacre of Ibus in Jos in 1945, in which thousands of Ibu ethnic were killed by the Aosa, Fulani and Birom. With their property destroyed or looted, the next was the incident in 1951 in which the popular and the charismatic Dr. Namde Azikiwe Owelo of Furniture, Zeke of Africa, later to become Nigeria's first ceremonial governor general and president after independence in 1960, and his party, the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, NCNC, lost the battle to form a government after the Western region elections in 1951 with Zeke as the premier of Western Nigeria. When politicians of the Bado People's Party cross-carpeted to support the action group to form a government with Chief Obafemi Awulu as the premier. This loss ultimately forced Zeke, whose party the NCNC previously dominated politics in both Eastern and Western region, to return to the eastern region in 1953 after a couple of frustrating years as leader of the opposition in the Western House of Assembly. This is widely believed, rightly or wrongly, to be the beginning of ethnicity as the basis of Nigerian politics. This watershed incident was followed by the massacre of Ibo Zinkano in 1953. Ironically, it appears as soft targets in an action targeted primarily at the Yoruba politic politician Ladoke Akintola of the Action Group, who, however, failed to turn up. The other key historical marketers, the other key historical makers, were the January 1966 coup led by Major Kaduna Nzogo, tagged an Ibuku in the dominant historical narrative in Nigeria by non Ibu ethnic groups, the July 1966 counter coup, Northern coup, and the civil war of 1967 to 1970, in which between two and three millions of Ibus lost their lives. 
This was followed by the affirmation of the civil Igbos were subjected to the discriminatory 20 pounds policy in which they were given 20 pounds in Nigerian currency, regardless of the value of the Biafran pounds in their position, as well as the abandoned property crisis in which the properties of Ibu that they abandoned in other parts of Nigeria, especially today's south-south region, were seized after they ran back to Ibu land in 1967 out of fear for their personal safety, were confiscated. In some, the history of the Igbo in Nigerian politics has always been that of overreactions to perception of Igbo domination of Nigeria. The narrative that the January 1966 coup was an Igbo coup has largely framed the Igbo in contemporary Nigerian politics, in particular the relations between the Igbo in the southeast and the northern Nigeria. I believed the January 1966 school was, looking back, a big mistake. But not because it was an Igbo coup. Because from the historical account, it was not conceived as such. It was a strictly military personnel. It was a strictly military affair. Within the armed forces and its planners and participants included several non-Ibo military personnel. There was no known concerted group ethnic Ibo effort in its planning, even outside, even inside the military, let alone outside the armed forces. Indeed, indications from some historians are that the main purpose of the coup was to release Chief Obafemi Awolo from prison where he was serving his sentence after conviction on treasonable felony and install him as prime minister. A whole ethnic group cannot bear the responsibility of for the actions of a few individual members of it. Just for example, as Fulani in Nigeria today cannot bear responsibility for the criminal and terrorist acts of his men who may happen to be Fulani. In any case, the Nzogu coup was frustrated and defeated by military officers of Igbo origins such as General Thomas Omunakwagunyi Ronsi and Colonel Chukwemiko Dumigujuku, although the genu was already out of the bottle. The lopsidedness of the execution of the Nzogu led coup in terms of high level casualties can also cannot also be glossed over. Understandably painful as it was, however, we have to tell ourselves the truth that the reactions to it, which continue to this day, have been extremely disproportionate. The January 1966 coup was a mistake, just as the July 29 coup was a second historical error, and two wrongs don't make a right because it was deeply naive and was unnecessary. The civilian politicians of the time would ultimately have resolved the political crisis in the country if there had been no military intervention. If the frustration was about the corruption of the politicians of the time, well, Nzogu would turn in his grave if we are alive today and would doubtless have concluded that he made a big mistake. For the corruption then was a kindergarten class compared to what is obtainable in Nigeria today. Here, I must tell a personal story. On October 19, 2019, I put up a birthday message on social media to General Dr. Yakubu Jack Gowan, Nigeria's former head of state, a former leader with whom I admit to a personal friendship of many years beginning during my career in the United States, in the United Nations in the early 1990s. Perhaps because of my use of the word humane in describing General Gowan from my personal knowledge of him, I was heavily criticized by hundreds of Twitter users, mainly but not exclusively Ibu, who felt I was wrongly celebrating a leader, the hood responsible for the deaths of millions of Ibu people during the Civil War. There is no more appropriate place and occasion than this lecture to address the misconception that I was insensitive of the death to the deaths of our family members, young and old, during the terrible civil war.
this was far from my intention because in my message I urged General Jack Gowan to step forward and play a leadership role in bringing the painful issue of the civil war and its lessons to closure so that Nigeria can heal. Because clearly, despite the victor no vanquished policy, Igbo people have remained heavily discriminated against in Nigeria in many ways, in particular in the political terrain in which there appears to be an unspoken conspiracy to prevent a person of Igbo ethnic nationality from becoming president of Nigeria. In the words of the newspaper columnist Ruben Abati, in a recent column on Gowon's 85th birthday with the caption, Gowon at 85 and Fanny Kayode. You can see this in this day October 22 of 2019, Dr. Abati wrote, Inter alia, let no one be in doubt about it. The Civil War 1966 to 1970 will always be a big question at the heart of Nigerian politics and inter-ethnic relations. In many ways, there is indeed clear evidence that the war against Ibus had not ended. Nigeria nurses a huge deep-seated prejudice against the Igbo man. It is the reason why there is no much dithering over whether an Igbo president should one day emerge or not. Let me return to my controversial tweet on Twitter. In the first place, I am deeply sorry and apologize to everyone whose sensitivity I offended if I mistakenly conveyed the impression that I, as an Igbo man, was uncaring about the millions of people, mostly Igbo, that perished in that war. Nothing could have been farther from the truth or my intentions. Consider my personal history. First, it happens that I hail from Nnewi Ojuku's hometown and do plead guilty to some sentimental, fraternal regard for the late Biafran leader. Second, if you are old enough and had the privilege of owing a Biafran passport, a symbol of Biafra's success in attaining diplomatic recog recognition by several countries as a sovereign state for the period it existed, take a close look and you will see whose signature was on the Biafran passport and made it a valid document. Isaac Mogalo, my late father, a former Nigerian foreign service officer who returned to the cabinet office of the Eastern Region Civil Service in early 1967 and later headed the consular services of the Biafran Ministry of Foreign Affairs after the region declared itself an independent republic. Third, I lost my uncle, my father's younger brother, Gatsin Mogalo. He was a Biafran soldier, killed in 1969 at the war front, I still remember. Like yesterday, my paternal grandmother's anguished wailings at her grandson's funeral in her in our hometown of Newe. Fourth, I remember a air raid, a air raid bunker in our family compound in Newe during the Civil War and the rush into its ambience, complete with the seats carved from the earth. During a raids, I remember eating fried crickets and grasshoppers during the war. The point is that, even as a child from age four to seven, I too lived the experience of Biafra. I was, it was personal, it was harrowing, but we need to heal, forgive collectively and move on as a country. Difficult as it might be, the Igbo should not remain permanently bitter about the loss of the lives of our loved ones. If we remain permanently bitter, we can't heal. If we can't heal, 
we can't compete effectively in the political terrain in Nigeria. But realistically, the burden is far less on the Igbo who were the main victims of the tragedies of war, but nevertheless have largely integrated back into Nigeria since the war, except, I would argue, in the political terrain than it is on non Igbo Nigerians who continue to resent the Igbo based on distorted political narratives. I believe that the class of today's military generals who fought, who fought to keep Nigeria one and who later emerged as military political leaders bears an even heavier burden of history to close this horrible chapter by putting it in its proper and more accurate perspective. Among this class, General Yakubu Jack Gowan, as Commander-in-Chief and Head of State during the Civil War, is uniquely placed to speak directly about the war, acknowledge the pain of the loss of millions of lives, and express regret for the loss of so many lives. It is a tragic failure of nation building that Nigeria's federal government sends official delegations to the annual commemoration of the Rwandan genocide but refuses to confront and address our own history of conflict and the millions who died in its wake and so far bitter memories fista we have difficulty in moving on because no one wants to address the pain directly Again, as an official of the United Nations who was involved in peace operations in Rwanda, Cambodia, and Croatia in early 1990s, I helped in my own humble way to bring peace, healing, and some degree of reconciliation in these countries with bloody histories that are making progress today. But they confronted their own history with the war crimes trials and truth and also Reconciliation Commission. We have failed to do so in Nigeria. General Gowon declared after the war that there will, there will no Nuremberg trials in Nigeria. That is just as well. For the question would have risen, who will be prosecuted? Who will be prosecuted? the defeated forces, in which case it would have been victors, justice, or the victorious ones, for it is beyond dispute that war crimes were committed against Biafrans, including the Asaba massacre, or both. I believe we owe ourselves as Nigerians closure. Our former military leaders who prosecuted the war need to show leadership in this matter. President Olusega Basanja attempted an exercise in national reconciliation with the Oputa panel. But for a variety of reasons, the effort was not successful. I also remember General Gowan's visit to our family compound in Inewi on December 30, 2005, for the inauguration of the Isaac Mogalo Foundation in memory of my father, an occasion at which he was the chairman and special guest of honor. It is notable that he made a conscious choice to participate in this event in India instead of a major meeting of middle best stakeholders he was built to address and which clashed with our family event, but to which he delegated General Domkat Bali to represent him. I believe it was General Gowan's first visit to Newi town since the end of civil war. Without prejudice to the larger issues of Nigerian history on that discussion here, I will always appreciate the former head of state's decision to honor my late father and I in this manner. Several Nigerian dignitaries who happen to be Igbo, including the late Dr. Alex Ekweme, former vice president of Nigeria, Chief Emeka Anyoko, the former secretary general of the Commonwealth, Chief Arthur Mbanefo, former Nigerian ambassador to the United Nations, Chief Chris Ngige, 
former governor of Anambra State, joined us for the occasion. I recall that the members of our local community in Nine will warmly welcome the General Gowon in their midst. This was, in my view, a leader who wanted a reconciliation. But Nigeria's Igbo problem remains and it has led to the revival of new Biafra movements, the most prominent of which is IPOB, Indigenous People of Biafra. Again, instead of addressing the root issues of the absence of equity and justice in our country, the near complete alienation of the Igbo from a serious sense of co-ownership of the Nigerian project, our political authorities engage in convenient obfuscation and double standards. They celebrate a unity of Nigeria that clearly is a myth. Of course, is a myth. But Avoid addressing the national question. Is this construct we can, is this construct we call Nigeria a nation? If so, on what basis? And if not, why? They stress the indivisibility and the indissolubility of Nigeria. But on whose terms? An indissoluble Nigeria in which some believe they are political masters and others believe they are being treated as political slaves and rightly reject that status. Our leaders have, again, conveniently labeled IPOB, a terrorist group. But the real terrorists in Nigeria kill and maim with impurity and no accountability. This is no way to build a nation. We must all reconsider and act differently to one another. If we want to remain one country, let me be clear. My presence, as I believe it is that, is that of a great majority of the Igbo, is to remain part of Nigeria. And I do believe that with a certain kind of national leadership, it is possible to build a Nigerian nation that can manage its diversity, achieve stability and posterity. But that outcome must be anchored on A, justice, equity and equality for all Nigerian citizens and B, a fundamental constitutional restructuring of the Nigerian Federation to return it to a real practice of federalism instead of the unitary federalism we have today. Outside of these two preconditions, Nigeria should sit across the table, look each other in the eye and discuss what are our peaceful options. The Igbo are hardworking, aggressive, sometimes loud, professionally and commercially savvy hospitable, adventurous, republican by nature, but politically weak, especially since the civil war. Ndibu now appear to have been psychologically and politically defeated by the combination, combination of the outcome of the civil war and the silent, silence conspiracy to keep them from political power. So we now have a second fiddle, mentality, unable to assert ourselves politically as a cohesive force in our national polity, which sadly remains driven by geopolitical and ethnic tendencies despite the wish and drive of some of us that you should graduate to issues based and ideological politics. While our politics as a country ought to move beyond ethnic considerations, all parts of Nigeria should embrace this approach. At the same time, it must not be conveniently used as an argument to deny the Igbo an opportunity to produce a Nigerian president. Why, when I ran for president in 2019, I did not run as an ethnic candidate. I ran on the basis of a clear vision for Nigeria, one in which our diversity, would be managed well by consciously building a nation instead of a it's a turn to it approach apologies to the author uh uh michaela 
wrong michael wrong who wrote a book of that uh, title <laughs> and ethnic revenge against perceived marginalization i ran on a vision for the economic transformation and wealth creation for the citizens of nigeria northeast the north the east the west and the south several individuals and voters told me they admired my vision and courage but it was still the turn of the north that of the Ibu, they said would come in 2023 nevertheless i know that my 2019 candidacy despite its appeal across ethnic boundaries was seen by many as daring novelty partly because i am Ibu. if that is the case i have no apologies for indirectly making a statement that nigeria belongs to all of us that i believed passionately that I had something to offer our country as a collective and that I don't see myself as politically inferior to anyone simply on the grounds of ethnic identity. Other, can, other characteristics of Ndibu we must address include the reality that Igbo politicians in contemporary Nigerian politics have been largely self-seeking and are unable to come together to advance their group interest within Nigeria. While this trait has been unfairly exaggerated as part of the convenient narrative to the extent that all the large ethnic groups in Nigeria also have internal divisions, it remains basically true. There are problems in Southeast states of Nigeria that were caused not by any Awasa Fulani or Yoruba Nigerian in Abuja, but rather by the leadership failures of Igbo politicians in leadership positions in these states and can be addressed without waiting for Abuja to give us solutions. These include environmental and urban planning disasters in places like Aba and Onicha. The latter is, in addition to having the largest single market in Africa, the most polluted city on earth, according to World Health Organization. Oh, other challenges include the failure to advance an effective agenda for Nigerian youth in the Southeast that can create jobs and the failure to develop a robust Southeast regional economic development zone such as the development agenda for Western Nigeria Dawn initiative. Moreover, many Igbo businessmen have also been largely self-seeking. They fail to see how they can invest for certain political outcomes and instead focus exclusively on the individual business interests. Now the path forward. The path forward. The truth is that the Igbo remain divided today between the pan-Nigerian vision of the great Zik and the more realistic one of Ujuku that paralleled the political dispositions of Chief Obafemi Awulu in the southwest and Ahmad Bello, the Sarudan of Sukutu, in the core north of Nigeria. I believe it is, simple, it is possible to bridge the two. But Ndibu cannot do it alone if other major ethnic nationalities in Nigeria continue with the business as usual. So here are my recommendations. First, to address Nigeria's challenge of nation building today, the Nigerian civil war and its impact should no longer be swept under the carpet by both our present leadership at the national and state levels, as well as the leading actors of the war who are still alive today. Our national attitude to history must change. History is a tool for healing and nation building. This is the approach taken in all developed countries with the challenging histories such as Germany, Japan, South Korea and the United States. The war must be addressed with recognition of the millions who died and a single and simple uh, and straightforward. I am sorry that this happened. I feel the pain of it all. Let us forgive from the leading actors of the conflict. Second, Ndibu should pursue the agenda of both 
constitutional restructuring and the election of our competent visionary Nigerian from the Southeast geopolitical zone as the president of Nigeria in 2023 as a matter of priority, persuading, lobbying other parts, uh, other parts of the country within the democratic context of the imperative of this approach in order to rebalance Nigeria along the lines of equity and justice. Ndi will have approximately 30 million voters of Igbo ethnic nationality in the southeast, the northern states, and the southwest. It is time for these votes to be organized and channeled in a more strategic manner. What people wrongly describe as the Igbo presidency rather than a Nigerian presidency of Igbo origin, a constitutional restructuring, and not mutually exclusive. Barack Obama did not run a black American presidency because he was the first black president of the United States. It was still an American presidency. Both will be beneficial for all Nigeria. I therefore beg to disagree with the view that Ndibu should focus only on a campaign for restructuring and should be uninterested in the quest for the presidency. That is a defeatist approach an impl implicit acceptance of a negative condition instead of a pro proactive a struggle within a democratic context to overcome it. Third, Ndibu must take greater interest in the need for fundamental electoral reform, arguing for restructuring while neglecting the imperative of electoral reform is short-sighted. For it is only an open and transparent electoral system, one with a truly independent electoral arbiter that can throw up a leader who will lead the restructuring of Nigeria. Clearly, the leadership in Nigeria today lacks the will to take this essential step to make Nigeria work again. Fourth, Ndibu must redouble efforts at regional integration and infrastructure and the South East. Success in this quest will benefit the region and even Nigeria as a whole. Fifth, Ndibu should aggressively pursue the renaissance of Igbo culture and language at home and abroad in order to restore Igbo self-confidence. I am very pleased to see that this is already happening. The origins of Nollywood are mainly Igbo land. They are mainly Igbo. And after lagging behind Yoruba and Aosa, TV entertainment, their channels, Igbo artists now have won. There are now Igbo days on Twitter when Indi Igbo tweet completely in Igbo language and other Nigerians from other ethnic groups have asked for translations in English so they can too join the phone. There must be a unified Nigerian world. Nigerian world view. If our country is to prosper, but there is also, <laughs> there also can be an Igbo world view within the Nigeria one, a world view that is not anti Nigerian but promotes Igbo culture and cosmology while reaching out across ethnic divides. Sixth, special efforts must be put into achieving an Igbo Yoruba intent that breaks the mistrust of the past between the two main ethnic blocks, just as engagement with our brothers in the North remains essential. This should be a positive, not a negative. Use of inter-ethnic relations. I am pleased to see a far greater intermingling of our young people across ethnic boundaries. And in particular, it appears that young Igbo and Yoruba are marrying themselves as if the world will end tomorrow. Now, conclusion. Ndibu need to take a thorough self-appraisal of their place in contemporary Nigerian politics. Along the lines I have indicated above, we must become more confident in Nigerian politics. As Socrates famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. 
Nigeria, on the other hand, should stop asking the Igbo to prove their Nigerianness. 50 years post-war, Ndi Igbo do not need to prove their commitment to Nigeria because that commitment is self-evident even to the blind. Ndi Igbo are arguably the most Nigerian of all the ethnic groups. Yes, our fellow countrymen and women should not either willfully or innocently confuse the picture of Ndibu in Nigeria with the IPOB phenomenon. IPOB is essentially a cry for justice and there can be no peace in Nigeria without justice. The moment of truth is approaching in 2023. Another rejection of the idea of a Nigerian president from the Southeast will undoubtedly lead to greater ethnic radicalization and more widespread separatist tendencies in the region, with the likelihood that that tendency will finally go into the mainstream. This would be a dangerous development, and all who are genuinely committed to Nigeria's unity should be concerned about this scenario in a preventive manner. It is time for the civil war to really end. Ndi will deserve their place in the Nigerian sun as of right, as Nigerians, and not as sovereigns. I conclude with a profound statement by Dr. Henry Kinzaga, the former Harvard University professor who later became National Security Advisor and then Secretary of the State of the United States the Napoleonic Wars. Kinsinger wrote, it is the temptation of war to punish, the task of policy to construct. Power may sit in judgment, but statesmen must look to the future. Thank you. God bless Ndibo. God bless Nigeria. Professor Kingsley Chinedu Mogalo, former Deputy Governor Central Bank of Nigeria. I am John Paul Ani. Thanks for your time in Media TV. It was